Just before we get started with today's video, I do want to give a quick plug to my podcast, The Casual Criminalist. We cover a lot of crimes, criminals, bad things on this channel. They always do well, so I decided to do something that just focused on all of that dark stuff. That new podcast is longer form, it runs for about an hour, it goes out every week, and it covers some of the darkest things that I could find on the internet. From the UK doctor, who was the worst serial killer in history, to the time an American socialite murdered her best friend with her car, allegedly. And much, much more, but it's also pretty laid back, more free form, with the occasional laugh thrown in, because isn't death hilarious? Weekly shows, wherever you get your podcasts, there are links below. It seems that every year social media and the news are full of stories and panics about trick-or-treating gone wrong, children being kidnapped while trick-or-treating, children being given sexually explicit material instead of candy by a house they visit, but most of all, stories of tainted candy. Treats that have been laced with drugs like LSD or marijuana, razor blades embedded in candy apples, and candy that's been poisoned by nefarious entities. Ew. All of these urban legends have scared American parents for years, leading to famous overreactions like x-raying candy bags, or not accepting anything not in a factory-sealed package, or some parents even forbidding children from going trick-or-treating at all. But all of these stories have to come from somewhere, right? On Halloween 1974, the parents' worst nightmare came to life. An eight-year-old boy suddenly died, poisoned by cyanide. It had apparently come from candy that had gotten while trick-or-treating. Other children had poisoned candy and in their candy bags too. It sent America into a panic. The very idea that a random mad poisoner would murder children, complete strangers with poisoned Halloween candy, appalled them. But as police investigated the death of Timothy O'Brien, the story that emerged proved to be more sordid, more horrifying than anyone could have imagined. This is the true story of the Pixie Sticks killer. In 1974, Houston, Texas was booming. In the past 20 years, the population of the city had more than doubled, making it the sixth largest city in the nation. The city, which had been long sustained by the shipbuilding and port trade, was now being supplemented by the aerospace industry, particularly NASA, based out of the Johnson Space Center and the petrochemical industry, Big Oil. In the sleepy Houston suburb of Deer Park, the O'Brien family seemed to have perfectly captured the American dream. Ronald O'Brien worked as an optician, a tech Texas State Optical TSO, which made and sold eyeglasses. He and his wife, Danelle, had two children, Timothy, age 8, and Elizabeth, age 5. Halloween 1974 had been fun for the O'Brien children. The family had gone to visit friends in the neighboring town of Pasadena, and they'd gone trick-or-treating there with their father and a couple of other children. When they'd returned home that night, Ronald O'Brien allowed his children to eat one piece of candy each from their respective stashes. Eight-year-old Timothy selected a Pixie Sticks, a flavored powdered sugar candy in a plastic tube resembling a straw. Timothy swallowed a mouthful of the candy and immediately complained that it didn't taste right. It tasted bitter, too bitter to be candy. His father gave him Kool-Aid to wash the taste out of his mouth. But within minutes, Timothy ran into the bathroom holding his stomach. He threw up and then he started convulsing. Then in his father's arms, he went limp and became unresponsive. An ambulance was called, but by the time he reached the hospital, Timothy O'Brien was dead. The suspicions of police about Timothy's death were soon confirmed. An autopsy showed the boy had been poisoned with potassium cyanide, enough to kill two full-grown adults. Testing the pixie sticks revealed more cyanide, enough to kill another two adults. The news that a child had died after eating tainted Halloween candy shocked the nation. Although urban legends about a mad poisoner who killed children with poisoned candy had been passed around for decades, in reality no child had ever been poisoned by eating contaminated trick-or-treat candy given to them by a stranger before. Houston went into a panic. The police department in Pasadena was inundated with trick-or-treat candy from residents who wanted it tested for poison. Four other tainted pixie sticks were found in the bags of Timothy's sister, the two other children they had been trick-or-treating with, and another family friend. The murderer had cut the tubes open, dumping out the top two inches of candy, and replaced it with cyanide, and then stapled the tubes shut again. None of the other children had eaten the candy, but one family was sent into a panic when they were unable to locate the pixie sticks that had been given. They rushed upstairs and found the boy asleep, clutching the unopened candy in his hands. It had been unable to get the staples open. But where had the poison come from, and why would anyone do something so appalling? The police were determined to find out and bring the murderer to justice. So 
So where did the five poisoned pixie sticks come from? Ronald O'Brien said they had come from one of the houses they had visited during trick-or-treating. His story was that the children had gone ahead after no one initially answered the door, but he stayed behind. The door opened, a man handed him the pixie sticks, and then closed the door again. Ronald caught up with the children and distributed the candy. At first, Mr. O'Brien couldn't remember which house he'd gotten the candy from. Police interviewed homeowners along the two streets the group had been trick-or-treating at. None had given out pixie sticks. Finally, after the third time walking through the neighborhood, O'Brien finally pointed out the house. It belonged to a man named Courtney Melvin. Police interviewed Mr. Melvin, and he told them he'd been working on Halloween night and hadn't arrived home until after 11 p.m. He was an air traffic controller at one of Houston's airports. 200 people had seen him working that night, so his alibi was rock solid. To the detectives, something felt wrong here. It didn't make sense that a random stranger in this nice suburban neighborhood would randomly give out poisoned candy to kill children. For that matter, the only person they knew for a fact had the poisoned candy in their possession was Ronald O'Brien. So they began to take a closer look at Timothy's supposedly grieving father. Ronald Clark O'Brien, aged 30, had never had any run-ins with the law before. In fact, he appeared to be a model citizen. He was a deacon at the Second Baptist Church. He also sang in the choir. He and his family appeared to have the perfect middle-class, white picket fence lifestyle that would have been the envy of many. But as police peered beneath the surface, they discovered all was not well with Ron O'Brien. He had a short fuse and thus found it difficult to hold down a job. In the past 10 years, he'd had 21 different jobs. He was suspected of stealing from his current job with the TSO and was close to being fired from there as well. He also had a history of spending vastly beyond his means and was currently over $100,000 in debt. He was so far behind in repaying these debts, he was close to losing the family home in Deer Park to his creditors. And then there was the matter of the life insurance policies. Having life insurance on your children was just as unusual in 1974 as it is today, especially for an amount that far exceeds the cost of a funeral. In January 1974, Ron O'Brien, without telling his wife, took out $10,000 of life insurance policies on each of his children. Children. A month before Timothy died, his father increased the amount of coverage on his and his sister's lives to $30,000. And a few days before the murder, the policy was bumped up again over the objections of the insurance company to $50,000 for each child. Police thought it strange that a man who was struggling to save his home from foreclosure would take out and pay for life insurance policies on his children. Things looked even worse for Mr. O'Brien when it was discovered that mere hours after Timothy's death, Ron O'Brien had called the insurance company to try and cash in on the policy he held on his son's life. It was sleazy behavior for sure, but police still found it hard to believe that a man would murder his own child for $50,000. And if he was trying to kill Timothy for the money, why would he give poisoned candy to four other children as well, one of them his daughter? Regardless, detectives now had some tough questions for Mr. O'Brien. O'Brien denied having anything to do with his son's death. He still claimed he'd gotten the poison candy while trick-or-treating. But that story increasingly didn't add up to investigators. People continued to provide tidbits of O'Brien's actions over the preceding weeks and months, helping them to paint a picture. One of his customers at TSO was a chemical salesman, and he remembered O'Brien asking him about different poisons, including cyanide, at one point asking how much would kill a person and where he could buy some. A chemical supply store in Houston remembered O'Brien visiting, looking to buy cyanide. Night. He left after learning the smallest amount available was five pounds. Then there was the odd behavior O'Brien exhibited around the pixie sticks on Halloween night. He seemed oddly jumpy whenever any children other than Timothy appeared about to open any of the contaminated candies. At one point, he almost vaulted across the table to prevent one of the other children from taking the candy out of Timothy's bag. On the other hand, his wife told police that Timothy hadn't originally selected the pixie sticks as his one piece of candy before bed. His father had told him that he didn't have time to eat the lollipop he'd originally wanted and then reached into the bag and pulled out the poison candy, telling him to eat that instead. More testimony and evidence was found. Co-workers told police that O'Brien bragged in the days before the murder that his financial situation was about to turn around. A pocket knife was found in the O'Brien home that had residue from powdered candy on it, an indication that Ronald O'Brien had used it to cut open the packages in order to add the poison. And he was overheard on the day of Timothy's funeral saying that he intended to use the money from his dead son's life insurance policy to take a vacation and make other large purchases. Police now believe that Ronald O'Brien had murdered his son Timothy for financial gain. In an attempt to cover his tracks, he distributed poison candy to other children, apparently not caring if they died too. Perhaps in the case of his daughter, 
He even hoped for it so he could collect on her policy as well. It was one of the most appalling crimes that anyone involved had ever encountered. Ronald O'Brien was arrested on November the 5th, six days after the murder. As the press caught winds of what he had done, they soon dubbed him the Candyman. O'Brien was charged with one count of capital murder and four counts of attempted murder. He pleaded not guilty to all charges, still claiming his innocence. His defense consisted entirely of the urban legend of the random Halloween poisoner, despite the fact that no stranger had ever killed a child with poison trick-or-treat candy, either before Timothy O'Brien's death or even in the decade since then, leading to today. Despite the fact that the prosecution had no definitive proof of where Ronald O'Brien had gotten the poison they alleged he used, they believed their case was strong enough without it. It was built on Ronald O'Brien's own words and actions, his apparent fascination with cyanide, buying and boosting life insurance policies, and his bizarre behavior on the night of Halloween. On June 3, 1975, he was found guilty on all counts after the jury had only deliberated for 45 minutes. He was sentenced to death and sent to state prison in Huntsville, 70 miles north of Houston, to await his execution. The other death row inmates detested him, child murderers not being popular in the prison population. O'Brien maintained his innocence to the very end. On March 31, 1984, after exhausting all his appeals, Ronald Clark O'Brien was executed by lethal injection. A crowd had gathered outside the prison, some protesting the death penalty, others in support of it. When it was announced that O'Brien was dead, some of the demonstrators shouted, trick or treat, and showered the protesters with candy. The death of Timothy O'Brien had a big impact on his community. Shortly after the trial, Danine O'Brien filed for divorce. She later remarried, and she and her new husband raised her daughter Elizabeth, avoiding questions from reporters. For years afterwards, the residents of Pasadena and Deer Park did not participate in trick or treating and had a hard time celebrating Halloween at all, the trauma of the murder having shaken them so badly. Despite the fact that Timothy had been killed by his father in an insurance scheme and that Halloween candy was only an excuse to poison him, the murder still breathed new life into the old urban legend of the random Halloween poisoner, propelling it to new heights. Every year, the stories got more horrifying and more outlandish. Poisoned candy, razors and needles embedded in apples, drugs in candy. Throughout the 1980s, the media whipped the public into a panic with constant warnings about tempered trick-or-treat goodies to the point that one poll indicated 60% of American parents feared that their children would be harmed by it. This was only one part of an overall hysteria that gripped America during the 1980s surrounding child safety and stranger danger. While this led to some positives, such as the creation of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, it also had negatives, such as falsely accusing several daycare employees of sexually abusing children. For Halloween, changes were made as well. Some communities stopped having trick-or-treating altogether. For those that did, new guidelines were put into place. Children and parents were encouraged to only accept candy in sealed brand-name packaging, turning away from homemade treats and things like that. Other community organizations, such as schools, churches, and clubs, came up with the trunk or treat as an alternative to traditional trick-or-treating. A trunk or treat is held in a parking lot made up mostly of adults who already know each other, supposedly making things safer for children. Whether or not you think trick-or-treating is dangerous, at least when it comes to poisoned Halloween candy, it seems that parents were trying to protect their children from a threat that simply didn't exist. Dr. Joel Best, a sociologist from the University of Delaware, did an extensive study on the Halloween poisoner legend and found no documented cases of a stranger giving children poisoned Halloween candy. The few examples of children who died from eating poisoned candy were, like Timothy O'Brien, given it by someone they knew. Best found that the vast majority of supposedly poisoned candy cases are hoaxes, many thought up by the children themselves as a way to get attention. Despite this, the myth persists to this very day and continues to evolve. The modern iteration revolves around marijuana edibles, gummies, or candies with marijuana in them that both police and the media claim might end up in children's trick-or-treat bags either by mistake or on purpose. As per usual, no evidence of this occurring has been found. Ronald Clark O'Brien remains one of America's most infamous killers. He took advantage of a playful children's holiday to commit a horrific crime and in the process changed the way we celebrate Halloween and, in fact, the way we view strangers, especially when it comes to our children. It is why, in some circles, Ronald O'Brien is known as the man who killed Halloween. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, please do check out my new podcast, The Casual Criminalist. Links are below. And thank you for watching.